Welcome back to Contacts. We are joined today by Josh Blumenthal, a.k.a. Blue, who is the athletic director at Wayland Academy in Wisconsin and is here to chat lacrosse and all things coaching. Thanks for being here today, Blue. Thanks for having me, Justin. Appreciate it. Well, let's dive right in. So you have a well-traveled coaching history. So why don't you go ahead and take us through your background? How'd you end up in this profession? And, uh, you know, the, the thing I really am curious about that I think is helpful for the audience is how did you end up landing your first jobs and any subsequent jobs? And this one year and now is actually a good storyline as you go through these, because I think often people don't know how to get into the business or how, if they are curious, what the network should look like. So if you can weave that into your story, that'd be great. I will weave away. So I'm originally from Long Island, New York, um, one up uh, playing baseball and lacrosse. And at the time, my mother said it's one or the other. And I figured, well, there's a lot of major league baseball players and mine, I'm not getting there. So I said, let me try this new lacrosse thing. And so I tried it and got into it. And fast forward, uh, wanted to play in college. But when I was in high school, I used to love just teaching kids. So I would actually, on my days off, we would have a day off during the week uh, where I would just stay after school and work with the middle schoolers. And I wound up going to games and coaching them. And, and I really fell in love with it. And I always something I wanted to do. I went to college, University of Rhode Island, and I played club lacrosse there. And then my sophomore year, I met a gentleman named Scott Shemensky, and uh, he was coaching out of high school. I said, have you ever thought about coaching? And I said, yeah, a little bit. So here I am coaching a JV high school team uh, in Rhode Island, an assistant varsity coach. And wound up going to this, the first ever state championship in Rhode Island. Um, and I just fell in love with it and uh, just realized that I wanted to make that a career. Now, obviously, coaching is great, but it doesn't necessarily put, you know, food on the table, at least not more than Chick-fil-A. Um, it, you know, so I knew that I wanted to get into administration. So I was down in Miami at a school called Palmer Trinity School. I was an athletics coordinator and lacrosse coach and sports information director. And as, as you know, Justin, you wear a lot of hats at, um, at an independent school. And uh, um, wanted to get my master's and had an opportunity to go coach uh, Division II lacrosse, NCAA, at Adelphi University, which is a pretty big powerhouse for lacrosse and get my master's, you know, more than half paid for. And I just fell in love with it. I got a, my master's in sports management, uh, stayed in the college realm, was up in Boston for seven years, met my, met my, my now wife. Um, and then when we had our son, I said, you know what, I, I, I still love coaching. I didn't necessarily love the recruiting aspect of it because it, it's you're on the road all the time. Uh, and so I got a, a position at St. Andrews, which is where you and I met, Justin, when, when your team came over uh, for a week to spend with us and started as an assistant AD and then got promoted to associate AD and was really happy there. But I hadn't reached my goal yet of being an AD. And so uh, in May, uh, Wayland Academy was advertising for an athletic director. I talked to the headmaster and he also said, oh, and by the way, we'd love to start lacrosse at some point. Um, and uh, just kind of was a match. So here I am in Beaver Dam from Austin, Texas to Miami, to New York, to Rhode Island. And here my, my wife says, you know, we, we've got almost the East Coast and the Middle Coast. Now we just got to get to California. So I guess I'll wait for, for you to have me come sign the big bucks and come work for you. <laughs> Well, be careful because once you come out here, you're never leaving. So make sure you get all the all the other stops checked off the box before you come to California. Uh, so we got a couple different things here going on with you because you are a coach and you are an administrator. We've got two different uh, approaches we can take and that I want to take. And what I usually ask is when you first became a head coach, what are the things that you found out very quickly you didn't know? And given your background, right, you started off as a sophomore in college, assisting, then you got into it a little bit more and you learned some things, right? But at each of these stops, there's something that you got to learn new, right? You're going from Texas to Wisconsin now, so you're going to have to figure out a whole different structure. Um, but what are the, the key pieces that people can latch onto that are just like, oh, wow, I didn't know you needed this, you needed to do this. And, and, and let's start from a coaching perspective. And then we'll circle back to the administration piece because you've done that for a while too. Absolutely. Um, from the coaching perspective, Justin, I, th I think the biggest lesson that I learned out of the gate, and, and I don't think that I'm, you know, in the minority on this, is when you played basketball, as you did, and when I played lacrosse, your coach could tell you to go do something and you would do it or you wouldn't do it, but it was within your control. Mm -hmm. And coaching, you're trying to impress upon these young men or young, young women 
what you want them to do, and then they have to go out there and do it. And it's really hard because you sometimes want it more than they do. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find a way that the thing that I found, the hardest thing, which I, I'm not perfect at, but I've gotten better at, is what motivates one person doesn't motivate another person. And so trying to find out there are some kids that like to get screamed at and, you know, get riled up. And there's some kids who, you know, need a pat on the back and it's going to be okay. And, and everyone's different. So the biggest challenge that I've, I've faced is every new team that I, I have been with is finding out what makes that individual player tick. So that's probably the biggest thing that, that I learned. Um, I had one player when I was at Regis College, and he actually begged me to scream at him. And I'm not a big screamer. He said, Coach, I, that's what I, that, I'm a football guy. He's actually from Huntington Beach. He goes, Coach, I, I, that's how I get fired up. He's like, I know you're trying to be nice to me. It doesn't work. So I have to scream at him, which is totally not in my MO. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. And then if I yelled at another kid, he's probably in tears on the bench. So, you know, you got to figure that out. So that's that's the coaching perspective. Mm -hmm. The administration perspective is that I've been asked this question quite a bit over the past year is what's your favorite thing to do as an, as an athletic director or in this case in Texas. And I, and I always say the same thing and it's going to sound a little funny, but I'll explain it is I always enjoy doing the field hockey scoreboard. And you might say, why, why feel like it's not that it's favoritism. It's that at St. Andrews where, I, where I was previously field hockey would most likely have a game on the first day of school, just whatever reason that was just their thing. And I always like the doing the scoreboard because at that point in time, we everything that we have done the prep for the school year, which is a, as you know, is a ton, it's all comes together. And we all do it for the kids. And at that point, it is the most innocent, basic reason why we got into this profession is to watch our kids play and cheer them on. And so my my answer to that to your question is every single state and organization does things a little bit differently. And you've got to figure out a way to get to that point where the kids are on the field playing, competing. And if they win, then that's obviously a bonus. But that's, you know, there's bigger things in life than that. Um, so it's figuring out Texas does it this way. You do it this way. So it's just not getting boggled down and just keeping your eyes on the prize of being out there, doing a scoreboard where I can put my phone away for two hours and just living in the moment. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. That's something I don't think we always take a breath in those moments. And I would agree that being out there observing as the administrator and just watching our athletes on the field uh, after all the work we do to get them there is very rewarding in itself. So I love that answer. I want to pick on something there and pull a thread in regards to Texas may do it differently than Wisconsin. You've been in Miami, you've been in the Northeast. Are there things that you could say as both a coach and an administrator that are transferable regardless? Um, and I don't want to say non-negotiables, but consistently show up in programs that are successful. And I use that word loosely because success is going to be defined differently depending on the resources. But are there some things that are consistent that no matter what, look, when I see this, the, one of these from my coaches, I know I don't have to worry about that person. Or when I see this from the administration, I know we're in a good place. These are things we want to run from. Anything like that you can offer? I, yes. And, and I would loosely circle back to what I just said, that I always have the best interests of the student athletes at my core. And, and I think that coaches need to have that too. And then you just hit on it. You know, one coach will say, if we go 15 and all win the championship, we're successful. Another coach could say, we had one win last year. If we get four wins this year, we tripled our wins, that's success. So it's not just, you know, a, a straight out number. It's it's just the environment that you're creating. And and I like to say as an athletic director, and, and I said this in, you know, in Texas is, I need to be the biggest cheerleader for the Wayland Academy Big Red. I mean, that, that I need to be the biggest cheerleader. And that's not just you know, on the field cheerleader, that's being a cheerleader, promoting, helping them when they get, in, when they get, you know, potentially in trouble with their academics or maybe discipline. And it's not, it's not that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to necessarily cut them breaks, but, but I'm going to be a cheerleader that know that when they come in, I'm not going to scream and yell at you. How can I help you? And, and we are in a service industry. We're trying to help these young men and young women get on to, in many cases, a college level or whether it be the military or what have you. So that is a non-negotiable that we have to have the kids best. Here. So every decision we make, has to, I used to joke all the time when I, when I coached college and even at St. Andrews, we would take the bus rides. And I said, guys, you guys, I want you to make the decision. You know, what, what's going to work for you? The only thing I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, change on is what movies we watch and what food we eat. Because I don't want to watch bad movies and I don't want to eat bad food. Other than that, you guys can decide or you women can decide whatever you want to do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, 
So keeping the student at the center of the equation, that's something that I think is always well intended, but doesn't always happen. Are there examples you can share from your experience where uh, it was clear that a decision was made keeping the student at the center of the equation where maybe it, it didn't message out into community or into uh, even the, the school itself where maybe they're like, well, why are we doing that and not taking into account that the student is the reason we are the students athlete, not an individual, but that's why we're doing it, even though the booster may want X, Y, and Z. Yeah, uh, I think every every independent school says this, and, and I think most of them, have, you know, believe this, but, you know, this holistic approach and, you know, whether it be four pillars or whatever, we here have four pillars. Uh, one of them is, you know, loosely athletics. It's called something else, but we'll just go with athletics for, for you know, for right now. Um, and athletics is, is, is not only is it fun, but, but it can be a savior for people too. Uh, it's a good way to get endorphins out. And so the, re the reason I bring that up, Justin, is when it comes to grades, you know, it's, that doesn't always have to be black and white. And is, you know, is it not as a student failing, is the student making progress? You know, why are they failing? What is, you know, what is the issues? Can, you know, can we have this, this young man or young, young woman maybe stay behind 30 minutes and do tutoring where it may not be clearly obvious to the school community that just sees a list, but there's some thought that goes into this. And again, keeping the students at, at the center of, of our attention um, a lot of times it comes down to grades and people that are, you know, maybe are not as involved in athletics don't quite understand that. Uh, but athletics can, I mean, look at you and I, I mean, we're in this, prepared. athletics obviously spoke to us and we wanted to give back in some way, shape or form. Um, and so, uh, you know, if someone said, if you had, if, if you put a, you know, a roadblock in, well, you got an F in this class, first off, I'd be scared of my father, but second off, if I, if you got an F in this class, you know, that, that shouldn't preclude you. You know, I think that should be a motivator instead of a precluder. Got it. So having been at multiple spots and landing where you are now in year one, what would you say from a lacrosse coaching standpoint and from an administrative standpoint? So two different threads on this one is the best thing that you do in your program that you have implemented over the years. That's had the largest ripple effect on your success and culture. What is the best thing that you do? And a great way to frame this for you because you just moved is what are you bringing with you? What are you doing? No matter what, you're going to get the lay of the land and the culture in the school, but this is a linchpin in what I do and it's going to exist. And here's why both as a coach and as an administrator that's seen this play out at different sites, what are kind of the core things, the best thing you do, if we keep it somewhat focused. Um, out of the box thinking, and I'll give I'll give you two examples of, of what I have done and what I am already in the process of doing here. Uh, we're just fine tuning it. Number one is bringing in uh, professional development, and I don't just mean professional development for the coaches. That's sure, but for the students. So one of the things that I have done is I have three different stops. I brought in uh, two different Army captains and a Blue Angel Navy pilot to come in and talk about. Um, Adversity, And I did it this past year about, you know, at St. Andrews with COVID, we didn't know how the season was going to go. And obviously that, you know, we could talk about that for hours. But point being is I brought in a Blue Angel 25 year veteran Navy pilot who the day after 9-11 was on a ship, I believe in pa Pakistan, I think he told me, and they were bombing Osama bin Laden's cave. Mm -hmm. And he was actually a blue angel and he flew it too low and he, and he had to resign. And he said, look, that's adversity. He said, do I let it get me down? No, I moved on. And so bringing in these people to impress upon our student athletes that yes, your lives are very important and we care a lot about it, but there are bigger things too. And realizing that, you know, be thankful for what you have type of thing. So it's almost just taking the athletics out of it and just saying that you are an ambassador for this school. I mean, there's no better representation on the road than athletes, because those are the ones that are on the road. And not to say that the band and the chorus isn't important, it certainly is, but on an everyday experience, you're gonna see athletes more in the community and how they get off the bus is really representative of the school. That's number one. Number two is there's an organization called Friends of Jacqueline, which is my favorite organization. They match uh, children with pediatric brain cancer with sports teams. And I have done this uh, with one, two, six or seven different students and they come with teams. And again, what it does is first off for them, it gives them a quality of life, which is awesome. But what it does to the student athletes, when we adopt this team, we do a press conference and, and we're working with them again at Wayland is it teaches you a couple things. 
Number one, think about your problems on a typical day. You know, you failed a test, you may be low on money, you had a fight with your significant other. These people, young people can barely walk most days. And so it just kind of says, yes, your problems are important, but just know what you're living in. So um, again, Justin, I, I take some out of the box ideas to, in my mind, the most important thing that, that we can do as educators is develop these young men and young women to become better human beings when they walk out the door. Yeah, and it sounds like what you're saying with both of those is you're using sports as a vehicle to impart these lessons that are then going to serve them throughout their life, right? How to give back to others with this Friends of Jacqueline program and how to frame disappointments and setbacks or whatever the theme happens to be in these uh, leadership development talks and, and presentations and even collaborations that you're putting together. So I think both of those great, great ways to get the kids involved. And I'd love to know more about this Friends of Jacqueline when we get off. Um, so as an administrator, a little different hat you're wearing than just coaching your team and making sure you put the best product on the field, which gives us a lens to participate and see some things that when we get caught up in our team, we often just don't have time, right? From an observational standpoint. But the other two seasons, you're walking around and air quote evaluating, right? Teams and coaches and just watching, participating, cheering them on, you said. I don't think we do this culturally enough where we look across another discipline for ideas and thoughts. We look, hey, well, you know, I'm going to call up the best lacrosse coaches I know to figure out what drill I should run versus like, you know what, actually, I'm going to talk to the volleyball coach. So I want to know, because you're in, a, in an administrative role, what have you learned watching other sports that are not lacrosse that you've then been able to take and apply either as an administrator to help grow your other coaches or directly as a lacrosse coach, but you didn't get it from lacrosse? Well, I look at I look at more instead of the X's and O's, I look at the coaching styles mm -hmm. and and you know how are you running your practices? You know, most people's practices, maybe not the pros, but most people's practices are two hours, give or take, you know. How are you utilizing those two hours? And the most successful coaches I know are the ones that when when the practice is over and you blow that final whistle, kids are like, We're over already? That went so quickly. That means they had a great time mm -hmm. because if, if it's dragging, they're going to let you know, you know, you're, you're going to hear the moaning and groaning. So that's something I've done. I also think that um, ice hockey has really helped me in the sense that they're so crisp with their substitutions mm -hmm. and everyone has to be in sync because you've got three to four lines going on. Everyone has to know exactly who's coming off and they work in such synchronization. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. And so, you know, I, I think, I'm a big believer in the more you bond teams off the field, the better they're going to be on the field mm -hmm. and hockey. It doesn't just happen that way. They have to know the tendencies of their, of their, now, again, this is, you know, NHL I'm talking about, but nonetheless, it's helped me to just tighten up my box and tighten up the substitutions. Cause that can make or break one goal here or there. And that might be the one goal. So hockey has taught me a lot about how to be on point. Well, let me follow up on that practice statement because I think often we talk in generalities on this show and some of the listeners want to know like, okay, look, you watch a ton of practices. You're evaluating coaching styles. You want to know how people are using their time. What do you offer as best practices for designing training to where those kids are? Well, we're done and they're getting better. And it's a combination of everything you've been able to watch and see in both. Wow. This is really good. And this is really bad. And, here's the best way to be efficient and maximize and our time and get the biggest return on investment. So there's a lot of studies out there that, you know, I, I'm not a psychology major, but I certainly like to keep up with the trends. And one of the greatest psychology reports I ever read was that adolescents at the teenage years, which is who we're coaching here, they have about a 15 minute window where you're going to have their attention. And so if you try and put in a 20 minute drill, you're going to lose them after 15 and then you're going to get annoyed because the drill isn't going the way you want it. Then you're going to push it to 25 and it's going to be, you know, this vicious cycle. The best practice plans I have seen, and this is something I try and do, is over a two hour period, you do about six things. That's it. You know, you make it all about quality and you do those six things for 10 to 15 minutes and you keep it fresh and you don't do the same practice plans every single day because kids get bored um, and you got to keep it fresh. So keep it fresh. And keep it keep it quick. Like keep it right. Keep it tight. So as you think back, 
over to evolution from your sophomore year of college until now? However many years that is. Too many. <laughs> How would you say your approach to coaching has changed? I, I've chilled out. You know, they used to say that I was, you know, I was an intense guy when I was younger. And they said, wait till you have kids. And I said, oh, yeah, right. And I've just, you know, because I have kids now, it's not even that they chill me out because they, they run me rampant. It's just that I see bigger pictures in life. And I, and I will now, when I talk to parents, will say, I wouldn't feel comfortable putting my son or daughter in this situation. And it's just kind of like I'm on the same level almost, where when I was a fresh, you know, green kid, 22 years old in college trying to coach, I had no appreciation. You know, I'm 22 years old. I have no idea. Um, so I've chilled out a lot. And I've also sought to find more moral victories in the games than I used to. It used to just be, did you win or did you lose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's important. And, you know, I always say that if winning wasn't important. We wouldn't have a scoreboard. But there's a lot of moral victories that a kid has been out there on their lunch hour every day working on the punting this football. And when he first started, he couldn't do it 20 yards. Now he's drilling 30s. And then in a the game, he hits a 35. -yard. No one's going to know how much work that kid put into it. But I'm going to know because I'm going to see him or her. I shouldn't just say him. And that is the things that really get me excited. In some cases, sometimes even more than wins. Right. And I think it's very interesting because it's the – the, the, the drip of, you know, what I joke when I say Shawshank to people, right? Pressure and time. You just keep doing a little bit of work, right? And seeds and plant 1% better. And all of a sudden that example of this kid punting and getting better, even though he's not kicking NFL level punts, right? Is where I, I think what we said earlier, the definition of success is going to change based on where you are, what resources you have, uh, what other circumstances are in the equation and the recipe. And I, so, you know, I think it's really important that noticing that as a coach, as you mentioned, having children changes it because now all of a sudden you're seeing it through their, their eyes. And, and, and you're right. It doesn't mean that, Hey, I'm going to go do something totally different, but it puts you on an even keel with the parents that you haven't been on before. So I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of that answer. Sports has a way of, helping with adversity right you said you bring in speakers to talk about that failure right you lose the game you got to bounce back you get scored on you got to go try to score again do you have a favorite or a substantial failure that you can point to that has been transformational in your journey and allowed you to find the success that you have now like being named you know texas lacrosse coach of the year um that that you know you can point back to and say yo man if this hadn't happened i'm not even sitting here yeah, uh, I would go back to uh, my college coaching years, and especially when I was head coach. I went into college coaching thinking that I had to be this image of what I thought college coaches were. Um, I thought I had to be, you know, I thought it was all about wins and recruiting. And certainly that, that's a huge part of it. <laughs> you know, you got you to feed your family. But I, there's certain things that I was intense on that I didn't have to be intense on. And I made it more about let's follow the rules 24 seven, then let's, let's take a step back. And that was a failure. And I look, and I'm still, you know, thankfully I'm close with, with the former players and we have a great relationship. And I have a rule, Justin, that if you've ever played la lacrosse for me, um, I'm indebted to you for the rest of your life, whatever mm -hmm. you need, you just make a phone call. And if I can physically do it, it's going to be done. And it's going to be done too sweet. Um, but I don't think that I, the image of what I thought, and what I was, I, I didn't think I needed to be that. Not, 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 you know, I was a hard ass. You know, you have to be a hard ass. You, you're looking after 18 to 21 year old young men. You know, they're, they're going to test you. Um, but I think moving forward to St. Andrews the last five years, um, I, I, I knew when I needed to push and I, know when I, and I knew when I didn't need to push, where I didn't know that. And that was a failure. Call it, you know, being naive, call it just not experienced. Um, and I appreciate that. And, you know, and, and I'm not a big pat myself on the back guy, but it was a, it was, awesome to be voted by my peers as coach of the year in Texas. And that goes up for USA lacrosse and, you know, uh, one of the best coaches in the entire country last year. And I, I don't mean that as, as a, as a tout, because that's not what I'm doing is I wouldn't have achieved that success if I wasn't a good guy in the way that I ran my program that I learned from the failures that I had at, at the college level. And it's a long winded answer, but hopefully it makes sense. No, it does. And I want to, I don't want to push back per se, but I want to follow up on the idea of what you learned from stop to stop. And 
I think people get the idea that like any job is a good job and that's not true. And it could be for a variety of reasons. It, it could have the greatest talent in the world, but you might not be a mission appropriate fit for that institution to begin with. Right. And so you're talking about who you thought you needed to be as a college coach. And then the, you know, the years you spent at St. Andrews and how you've shifted and changed and, and rethought some things. Like, can we talk for just a second about this idea of being a mission appropriate fit and how the culture of a school matters? And, and sometimes it's like, you could be a great coach, but it's just not the right fit and being emotionally aware enough to kind of think through those things in advance before you jump into a situation. And maybe what that was like for you with this situation, this move you're making now or one of your previous moves. One of the first things I do is, is, is I look at the mission statement and I, I want to know what, what are they preaching? Um, you know, some schools do a better job of following up on the mission statement than others, but at some point there was a committee or a core group of people that came up with, this is how we want our school to be run and to be seen and to produce our graduates. Um, and so um, I think it's important that, that you do your due diligence. And I think, you know, a lot of times, you know, our younger years, you're just excited to get a job. As you just said, you know, not every job is a good job and, and you've got to be true to yourself. And I think if you go to a school that doesn't jive with your personal beliefs, you can only fake it for so long. And that's something with Whalen. Um, it was really in line with, with my personal beliefs, how they treat the students. And I haven't even met them yet. This is just what, you know, I've inferred from the head and when I came on my visit. And everyone says the same message. And if everyone's saying the same message, which in this case is caring for the students, holistic approach, and, you know, just wanting to get better, then you're in a good spot. And so you've got to ask some pointed questions to, to get what you hopefully ultimately need to know. Yeah, I love that. And it's something that having a background that you've had at different places that I had at different places, even when I first got back here, I would say I wasn't a mission appropriate fit at that time. And I had to evolve into that based on the values of the school and where I was coming from and how to meld those versus just making a decision. Hey, this isn't right. No, it's just like, Hey, I got to relearn what this institution prioritizes over my previous two stops and whether or not to your point, I'm a fit. And can I become one versus, you know, faking it or, or trying to, you know, fit in somewhere where it's not going to work out long term. So I just think, as you mentioned, you know, when you're young, you just want a job. And sometimes, you know, as you think about like some of these NBA players that get drafted first, second, third, and they're on these bad teams, like that's not great for their development, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to have some mentorship. Actually, you always do. But uh, great answer to that question. Let me go to this next one that I think I've been reading Last year, I read two books that were really transformational for me. One called Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke, a uh, professional poker player, just talks about how we usually result versus evaluate our decisions, right? We evaluate the result. And uh, it's this whole deal about uh, decision-making processes. And then this other book by Adam Grant, I just read called Think Again, which really is just again, challenging you to question your thoughts. And hey, when did you establish that thought? And they use this great analogy that none of us would be okay trying to use Windows 95 as an operating system anymore, but we're still holding on to, you know, ideas that we developed in 1995, right? So how do you challenge them and either confirm them or find new ways to do things? So a long-winded segue to what have you most recently changed your mind on from a coaching standpoint, I used to be over here and now I'm over here and here's why. So I used to be wanting to win. And when I lost, I was like inconsolable for like a day. Um, I'm still inconsolable, but it's, it's a lot less because now I see my son who's on the sidelines with us. And I tell him all the time, no matter what the scores, I turn to him and, every, and I've, everything's okay. You know, so I've learned that it's, it's good to include your family. I think that's great. Now, for me at St. Andrews, we would we were in a big conference, as you know, we were all over the state. So we would do overnights and having my son with us on the bus and seeing him with the guys in the back, doing, you know, whatever, whatever they were doing. Uh, he's probably eating snacks he shouldn't have been eating. Um, that to me is 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 awesome. And so I have I have changed my mindset using that as a microcosm is that fun and success are not mutually exclusive. And, and I think that the two of them really jive together. And I think a lot of people think. I shouldn't say a lot of people. There are coaches out there that think we're not going to have fun. We're going to we're going to work our tail off for two hours, and you know we're we're going to you know we're going to put these guys and these gals through the ringer. And at some level, yeah, that's probably true. 
but I, I think it, the you know how many people are going professional? Not you know not many. You know it's like two percent of the entire NCAA athletes. So I think you've got to factor in fun because at the end of the day, Justin, this is what I come back to is what I've realized. You're a basketball coach. I'm a lacrosse coach. You played sports. I play sports. Okay. We all got into sports because we had fun with it. At the core, we're all little children still wanting to have fun, play. You were playing in the playground, I was playing in the sandpit, and now we've evolved to the court or the field. You have to make sure that that person that started with whatever sport it is did it for fun, that it still remains fun at some level. And it can get harder, obviously, and you can compete more, but you've got to get fun, and I think fun and success are parallel. Yeah, I would agree. And I think as we evolve as coaches and get more experience, it's a lot easier to figure that piece out, right? So those that are younger or newer to this, how do you build that in right at the beginning? And, and I had this realization I've, I've shared on the show before where I coached the varsity boys basketball team and the middle school girls team at the same time. And I would find myself on the sideline of the varsity game frustrated and at the, the middle school game, laughing at the exact same thing. And so it's like, well, how do you bring that atmosphere of play, right? Of beginner's yep. mind of all of those things to your teams, which is why you got into it in the first place. So I love that answer. I also want to follow up on the get your family involved. And I think your son's on the bus. My kids have been traveling with us since I started this. And what I think sometimes goes unsaid, and I would encourage people to make sure they're, they're not paying attention to, but taking advantage of the opportunity is those athletes that you are coaching and creating a culture with and setting core values with, they end up co-parenting your children, right? And they're instilling those values in a trickle down. So whatever you allow to happen in that team and in that program, your own children are seeing that and learning from that. So keeping that in mind and then getting them around that does wonders for us raising our own children. So I don't know if you've experienced that or if that's something you want to chime in on or not. You said it perfectly. Uh, the, one, the one thing I will tell, I'll tell you a quick funny story here. So my son gets into the teams and every time we get in the car, if it's just him and I, daddy, how's this guy doing? How's this guy? How's this one's injury? I mean, he cares so much about it. So about two years ago, when he was uh, four and a half, five years old, he was, you know, he was of the age where he could understand things more. And he gets in the car one day, Justin, and he says, Daddy, when I get older, I want you to coach me in lacrosse. And I turned to him and I said, Ethan, we have a great relationship. Let's not ruin it. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> so we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But no, you, you hit the nail on the head. I, there's nothing for me to add to it. All right, let's do this. You, you get to jump in the DeLorean and go back in time here. And for those of you that aren't old enough, that's a Back to the Future reference. And you get to grab young college sophomore blue and say, hey, look, I know you're getting into this. Here's the keys to the test so that you can be as successful as possible in whatever way you want to define that term. Not saying, hey, I wish I had made this choice differently, but really just like, here's the advice I have for you. What would you offer yourself? This probably is not the advice that you're that you were expecting I was going to give, but I'm so proud of what I've done. I've just finished 20 years and I've gone from coaching when I was in high school to now having my son with me. And I've made a lot of good friends. I would say just follow suit and do exactly what you did. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot I would change. I, I am just, I'm so proud of not just the coaching, but the young men and, and the young women I've coached, I coached the Babson women's lacrosse team of who they become. And that's what makes even though I'm not in the markets with them anymore, Facebook is so great because I can follow them. And this one's having a baby and this one inviting me to the wedding. And that to me is the greatest thing. And, and I, I wouldn't trade that for the world. So I must've done something right. And uh, I would just say, follow suit, you know, just hear the keys. Don't screw it up, Josh. Yeah. Let me flip this then. Let's go. What's the best or one piece of advice that you've received over the years that has been most transformational for you since you don't have advice for yourself let's see if you got advice from someone else that you could offer uh two two pieces of advice one is specific to sports and one is not the one that is not specific to sports it's it's a charm that my mother gave me many 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 years ago when i was probably my son's age and it's a charm and it says live love laugh and that is the motto that i live my life by um if you live in life to the fullest if you're loving people and being loved and you're laughing. I mean, you've known me for, you know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. a, you know, prankster and a jokester. Um, you got to have some fun too. So that's number one. 
from the coaching standpoint, my my high school coach, who then was the head coach at Adelphi when I was there, is a gentleman named Gordon Purdy, who is quasi my father, um, as well as you know my friend. And he would stress to us that there in life there are peaks and valleys, and he would put it towards games. You're gonna have peaks and you're gonna have valleys, and you're never gonna be in either one for too long. So don't get too down on yourself and don't get too high on yourself because before you know it, you're dropping down or you're rising up. And that's something that I, you know, you're down, you know, you 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 know, you, you put together a game plan. It goes out the window in two minutes, you know, because it doesn't work. And you're down four nothing in the first quarter. Well, you could you could put your head head between your tail and you know run away, or you can say, you know what, this is a this is a valley. How can we get back to the peak and break it down almost strategically and, and make it work? Absolutely. And we talk about that here. Growth is not linear, right? It looks like the stock market and figuring out how to navigate those down moments, the valleys, as you call them, and to keep the peaks in the proper perspective is so important to what we do and how we, I don't say raise, but mentor these young people that we're working with. Are there any tools that you can offer that are go-tos for you as you lead your department, as you lead your team that I would say are maybe mistake response pieces or things that you use that are repetitive for your kids that if I pulled one of the, the, the St. Andrews guys aside, say, hey, what, give, give me the top three things that, that Coach Blue says, what would those be? Um, number one is, I, if, I, mean, I probably shouldn't say this on your podcast, but I don't believe in bullshit. I am a straight shooter. I would rather just give it to you straight. I'm not going to be rude about it, mm -hmm. but you know that when it's coming from me, it's going to be the God's honest truth. Um, number two is that, as I mentioned it previously, if, if you ask me to do something for you, I will do it. And if I say no, it's because I physically cannot do whatever you want. So just know that I'm going to go to bat for you 10 times out of 10. And whether it's reference letters, I mean, I, I probably get asked once a month for a reference letter. And I love that. And I absolutely love that. Number three, it's I keep things in perspective. Um, you know, and again, whenever I can add in humor, Sometimes I do it, you know, I'll give you an example, a guy, guy, kid gets injured on the field. You know, it's always, you know, as a coach and your heart goes, you know, through your throat, you're nervous when you can't show that though. And once that, once I can tell that, that the person is, you know, moderately, moderately. Okay. I try and make a joke, be like, this is the way you needed me to call a timeout. What's wrong. You know, just to try and make them laugh a little bit. So, and that's like the worst of the worst. So obviously everything above is just, you know, kind of just jovial stuff, but just try and keep things in perspective and, and just try and make people feel more comfortable in whatever setting that is. Yeah, no, I love that. Thank you for that. One more question. And I'm going to use this more for our athletic directors meeting that we're having next week, two weeks from now for the league. And we have these videos being made of, of coaches kind of explaining, Hey, you know, here's, here's our athletic directors actually explaining to coaches, here's why we do what we do, right? Here's why the kids need us, et cetera. If you have one in the bag, or even if it's just going to come to you, can you tell me a story of one of your most memorable experiences from being a coach, whatever that may be? You mentioned weddings, kids being born, right? All these different things. Maybe it was a game, whatever it is. But as you go into the bag of like, yo, my name is Josh Blumenthal and I coach lacrosse, right? It's like, here's, or I coach and I'm athletic director, whatever it happens to be. But, you know, here, here's something to take with you to keep in mind when you're feeling like, you know what, I just can't do this anymore. There's, Go ahead and pause on that. Think about it. Right. Here you go. There you can. All right, go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. The, the answer to your question is, I would tell myself and other coaches, there's going to be one. And what I mean by that is, you're not going to know that you're making a difference in anyone's life, but there's going to be that one person that's going to come to you and say, coach, maybe it's as, as critical as you saved my life. Or coach, I learned this lesson from you. I, I, I'll, give, I'll give you a real basic example. Uh, my father was a, is a, or is uh, a two-time uh, Vietnam veteran, two-time tour Vietnam veteran. Um, so because of that, we had to show up like three hours early at the airport because he's just, you know, we need to be there early. And I have taken that and I had a rule and I still do. If practice starts at four, we start at 345. You are dressed, ready to go. 
Um, and, you know, kids don't necessarily understand that. They don't like it. So let's fast forward. A couple of years later, we had a little reunion for my team. And the guys that really used to complain about it the most were like thanking me for it. And I said, why are you thanking me? He said, first of all, he said, from a job standpoint, we, you know, we always show up early. We get the best shifts. We get the best this. Also, you become uh, just more organized and you look more professional. So that's number, that's, that's the basis of it. Number two, if I can give you a second one there, uh, some advice that I would give a little bit off the cuff here, but uh, I was once told this advice by a former NBA all-star player who, who I was friendly with. And he said, Josh, do you know why I was an NBA all-star? And I said, yeah, cause you were a pretty badass player. He goes, it's not cause I was a great player. I said, he said, it's because I hustled and hustling is a skill. It's not God given. It's a skill. And so as a coach, just as you want the kids to hustle, you got to hustle too. And I don't just mean hustle blowing the whistle. I mean, doing the paperwork, getting stuff done, getting it ready so that the kids can show up and you can show up, coach and leave. You don't want to bring the baggage with you on the field or on the court. You want to hustle, get as much stuff done, whether that's reference letters, whether that's phone calls, whether that's pulling someone aside and say, look, you know, something didn't look right with you today. What's going on? That's all hustling. And it doesn't just happen. No, Absolutely. Great way to end this up. I love that. Hustling is a skill like anything else. And I would 100% agree with that. I think often there's a there's a thought that some things are innate and some things can be learned, but pretty much all of these things are skills. And if you put time into it, you can get better at it. So great way to wrap up and give some advice that uh, that we didn't have earlier when I asked the question a different way. So coach, thanks for being here. Hopefully Wisconsin is everything you hope it can be. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it, Justin.